I think we, <coughs> we can start now. So a very, very warm welcome to uh, all of you who are here uh, live today. Welcome to this uh, 17th uh, teaching in our series on the Mahamudra pair, 17th and penultimate. Uh, all being well, we will finish next weekend. And to those of you uh, joining us on YouTube, then good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. So today, uh, after a little revisiting of um, some of the more recent verses, we will be looking at compassion through verses, I think, 22 and 23 of the prayer. And so uh, always when we start, it's important that we start with our very, very best motivation. But in particular today, uh, our topic is a huge focus on compassion, enlightened compassion. So let's start with a, as best a loving heart as we can. Of course, it's, uh, it's a big ask, as they say, because we can't just, unless you're really, really good, and even then I wonder, you can't just switch on your most loving, most compassionate mood. It's not as though you have a switch somewhere and you can just... Uh, although, uh, when I, I took part in some research a couple of years ago, where they put you in the scanner and you have to meditate and do things, and they actually, and you have headphones, so you can get their instructions. And they say, like, now practice compassion. So you have to sort of, and then now look at the same images without compassion. <laughs> and so on. But anyway, uh, what I'm asking you to do, if it's at all possible, is to be as loving and kind and compassionate as you possibly can be and to feel you're here um, for everyone, for everyone, and in particular, for all of those connected with you in this most precious human existence that you are enjoying just now. Thank you. Sonje chodon soji chonon la janchu bado dagi chapsunje. Dagi jin so ji pe sunam ji, rola penchira sonji drupara jo. Samchen tamche dewa dong dewe judan dempara jo ji. Dongal dong dongal ji judan tralawara jo ji. Dongal me pe dewa tamba dong nen tralawara jo ji. Nirin chadan ne tang tralwe. Tanyong Chambola Nepara Jorji Dolje Chanchen Salon Arodang Mapa Mela Jorji Kampopa Dusum Shecha Kunchen Kamapa Cheshi Chunje Jupas in Umdang Krita Sasum Palden Dropaso Sablam Jaja Chela Nyanipe Yame Droganda Po Kajula So Wander So Kajula Manam Jupa zeno nam tara chinche lo, shenno gongje kampara sumpa shin se no kuna chekshen me padam. Zedya dada chope gongchen la, nye kura shenpa me paru chinche lo. Mugu gongje kura sumpa shin, nga te go jepe lama la. Jundu sovan depe gongchen la, chunen mugu jivore chinche lo. Yeng me gongje mushira sumpa shin, Kansha tope mo somade, macha dekare jope gongchen la, gongcha lo dan tralwara jinje lo. Nam to mo wo chukra sumpa shin, chiyang mayen chiyang cha wala. Manga ropa cha we gongchen la, kode yerme topara jinje. Deyata shame shamawati shameta shatru Om kurim om kurim arajite karota Ke ore tejo vati olo yane vishuddha 
Nyamale malapan haye kukure kata grase krasana wo muke paramuke a muke shamme dawane sawa graha bandana ne negre yetwa sawa bawa prava dina ve mukta mara pasha safitva buddha mudra no katita sawa mare butsarita hare shuddha Vega Shantu Sava Mara Kama. Alan Samuel Lamar and Poche Dagi Chivara Pende Denshola Tadren Champo Gone Chesonte Kuson Tuchi Nadrup. Sahadu Sol. Thank you. So, uh, because in a way it's relevant to today, and because it's an important point that I'd like to just spend a minute or two with. I'd like to go back to verse, hmm, whatever it was, uh, the verse we had about, uh, verse 19, about how Mahamudra and Dzogchen and Majamaka, the great middle way, they are all the same. And uh, so we, looked at that topic, they're the same in as much as they are each a route, a way to reach the same end, which is Buddha mind. There's only one Buddha mind. There aren't two or three. There isn't a Kaju one, a Nimapa one, a better one, a worse one. The view is so important and we can never go deep enough. Buddha mind has always been. It is right now. It always will be. It never began. It will never end. This is where we're going. It's the one and only truth. In Sanskrit, it's called the one and only, the one and only. So any legitimate path, and some people might think any legitimate religion has to end up there. I mean, it doesn't matter what we call it, Buddha, nature, God, George, Ethel, it doesn't matter. If it is, it is. If it isn't, then we might just as well just go off and I don't know what. <laughs> if there is no sacred, changeless, always was state that our faith is trying to help us to, uh, well, but there is. That's the way we see it. And so Dzogchen path, Mahamudra path, middle way path. It's, middle way path means the path of the six paramitas. It's a tradition. It's what we're really talking about. An Indian tradition that went to Tibet. It's very strong. They all end up in the same place. So from that point of view, to know the one is to know all. Now, this is what I wanted to focus on, this phrase at the end of that verse. In, in Tibet, it's incredibly famous, and especially in our lineage. It's chik she kun drol. Chik means one, she means to know. Chik she, you know one. Kun drol. Kun is everything, drol is liberated. If you know that one, that one, then all is liberated. It's also the name of a whole series of empowerments, the chik she kun drol. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about knowing that one and only truth, 
liberates everything. Now, that phrase can be seen in another way, and it makes a lot of sense in another way. And it's like the uh, universe in a grain of sand uh, quotation. If we could go deep enough into anything, it would reveal everything. Like my fingernail. If I could really go deep and understand enough about the fingernail, you know, like for instance, if I could go into its atomic structure and all the rest, I'd start to understand biology, its interdependence on all the rest. If we could go deeply enough into any one thing, it would reveal more and more and more. And in the end, it will become a portal to everything. There's a lot of truth in that. And especially in Buddhist stories, Zen stories, Kaju stories, there are moments of awakening when a tiny thing, a handful of food, something the eyes see, a slap on the face, Tilopa hitting Naropa with his shoe. When a moment can become the portal to everything. There's a truth in that, but it's not what that verse means. It means that once we know Buddha mind, and you know, with all of the provisions, riders that have been mentioned, you know, you can't know it, it knows itself. We need to quieten down our consciousness so that that Buddha mind knowing itself is just there and so on and so on. But when that happens, it liberates, it reveals everything. So why am I going back to that today? It's not that I forgot it and I'm catching up. It's because I realized in preparing for today's verses that uh, we need some prior knowledge of the Buddhist path. We're all on a path. If you weren't on a path, you wouldn't be here today with me. Either if you're already enlightened or already a bodhisattva, who has relative enlightenment, you wouldn't need to be here. You'd be already benefiting from Buddha mind as your default state. You'd still have your baggage, your karma happening somewhere on the surface of your mind, but your default awareness, awakenedness that will never leave you will be Buddha mind. You wouldn't need to come to a Ken Holmes talk you wouldn't have doubt. You wouldn't have fear. We all have fear, sorry to say, on one level or another. On the other hand, if you were totally pickled in samsara, you probably never have any connection with these Dharma teachings and you wouldn't be here anyway. So if you're listening to this talk, you're on a path. And a path is a path, it's a simile for a journey. You start out in one place, you end up in another place, otherwise there's no point going on the journey. And the journey varies. What you need to do at each stage of the journey is different. And the sort of um, advice that's relevant to each stage. So I had some fun in the last couple of days trying to think of an imaginary journey, which would be quite different in each stage. I'm not quite sure. I ended up with two possibilities. So one was from Scotland to an airport, probably to Heathrow. And then because you could only afford a certain flight, a stopover in one of the uh, Middle Eastern countries with very strict rules about, for instance, no alcohol or needing to cover yourself if you're a lady or whatever. And then on to 
Mumbai airport, that's where the flight's going, to Goa for a bit of time on the beach, and then another flight up to Kathmandu, and then a helicopter flight to Helambu and Mount Everest base camp, and then up Mount Everest, right? Just in a journey like that. So if it's your, your, your first time, And by the way, the journey we are on, there's no return. We are going and leaving stuff behind, never to visit it again. But anyway, in this imaginary journey, for instance, the instructions once you get to the beach in Goa are put on your swimsuit. Now, if you're staying for a couple of days in one of these Middle Eastern countries, uh, it may be not be a good idea to put on your swimsuit and go out on the streets. <laughs> and then if you're in Everest Base Camp, it might not be the best time to put on your swimsuit either. Uh, you need to put on warm clothes. But those warm clothes, you don't want to put them on on the beach in Goa either. And so on and so on. I leave you to your own fantasy to make it up. You know. The instructions that are relative, what you need to do in order for it to work, in order to get to the airport on time, and so on and so on, everything. And then your supportive literature. You know, now your helicopter's landed in Helambu. You're in Nepal, beautiful altitude, rice terraces, and all that kind of thing. And so it says, while you're here, you should go and look at this, look to the right, look to the left. Before sunrise, go up this mountain to see the sun rising, rising over K2 and things like this, you know. Those instructions, look out your window to the south. If you're in a, an airport in Heathrow, it won't be the same. You won't be seeing the sun rise over. Kanchenjunga or K2 or whatever it is, you'll be seeing an industrial estate. I was tossing up between that imaginary journey and uh, an imaginary future where, like Elon Musk, we've ended up on Mars a few generations later. The only humans left are the ones who've grown up in a synthetic bubble on Mars, and they've been eating artificially produced food and drinking their own recycled urine and so on. And so now the time has come where Earth is habitable again. And so you've got your instructions. And it's the first time you're going to go in the rocket ship. And so you've got your instructions, what you can do, can't do, what you mustn't do while you're going back to Earth. And then once you land on Earth, you can actually walk around in fresh air and breathe. You can pluck fruits from the trees and so on and so on. You were born on Mars, you grew up on Mars. You had no idea what that was like. There are rivers you can go and swim in and so on. So the instructions and the description in that journey, you know, uh, stretch up your hand and pick a pear from the tree. You can't do that in the spaceship. <laughs> You've still got artificial dehydrated food. So anyway, we're on a journey. And if we don't understand that fact, and if we read about Dzogchen and Mahamudra, we read the songs of Milarepa, of Longchenpa, of all, all of these things, and we try and apply them here, to where we are, it's going to be a mess. We need to know what is relevant to our own situation. And today we're looking at the verses on compassion. And it's very important that we understand that the whole of this Mahamudra is premised on the fact that we've developed the Bodhisattva heart and mind 
and attitude as the foundation for all our Mahamudra practice. And of course, those of you who've done or who are doing Mahamudra foundation practices, Mahamudra, know this, our refuge, our bodhicitta, and so many qualities need to be there before we are ready for this primarily meditation journey of Mahamudra. So this is why I sent out to everyone who's signed up for the course this um, diagram about the stages of the path. So I'll put that on screen now and talk about it very briefly. Uh, in January, February 2021, I gave a series of five Zoom talks on this. And if you want to know more, you can refer back. You can refer back to that. Um, so let me find the. Mm -hmm. Diagram. Okay. Can you put up a hand if you can see the yes, good. So there are three sections to this. Um, on the left, you've got uh, a chart I use to show in general, in Mahayana, the five stages of our journey. Uh, it goes from the I don't have a pointer on this, but you can see the little meditator wrapped up in the cold down in the bottom left, who is on a journey to become Buddha, top right of that diagram on the left. And there are five phases. The first phase accumulation took our Buddha Shakyamuni more or less a cosmic eon, many, many lifetimes. And it's a journey where we go through a development of ourselves. And in particular, you can see in blue, it says the four eliminations, where we need to get rid of all the darkness, or most of the darkness, in terms of anger and jealousy and pride, and ignorance, desire in us. And uh, we need to um, so the four eliminations is actually whatever's unhealthy in us needs to go. Whatever could be unhealthy that we don't already have we need to make sure we don't get it. So for instance, you may not be much when you start the path. But imagine you practice a lot, you meditate a lot, you study a lot, and you become a very appreciated human being in other people's eyes. Well, you might find pride developing. Maybe before that, you didn't feel there was much to be proud of. So anyway, we need to get rid of what's harmful that's there. And that's number one. Number two, make sure we don't develop what's harmful that isn't there yet. Number three, we need to improve the good qualities, the kindness and the generosity and so on that's already within us. And then number four, we need to acquire good qualities. Now that's lifetimes and lifetimes of work. That phase of accumulation is accumulating goodness and wisdom to ourselves. Particularly goodness, a huge karmic bank account. The second stage, integration, is where we work hard on the wisdom, on the shunyata, on the view of Mahamudra, the view of Dzogchen, and so on. In those two green phases, we do not yet have realization. 
So on the right of this chart, you can see that the experiences we talked about last week in the verses about experience and realization, all the very useful, meaningful meditation experiences will be developed and refined in this green first two phases. There are the phases in which we have to be reborn through the power of karma. And where we don't have presence of Buddha mind. When we come into phase three, insight, that's the first bodhisattva level, from there on upwards, we have realization. Realization becomes our default basic state. In phase four, we cultivate that insight. It's called phase of cultivation until there is nothing, nothing left but total Buddha mind. And then we're Buddha. Phase five, no more training. We won't get to phase four without phase three. It develops out of it. We won't get to phase three without phase two, our deepening awareness of the void, dreamlike nature of everything. And an authentic understanding of that won't come without the phase of accumulation, which is where, from the very outset, we develop the bodhisattva's loving care for all other beings. So I wanted to mention that. Now, also in the third, second column, we can see that the classic bodhisattva path, which took our historical Buddha three cosmic eons to go across, can be traversed, crossed in a handful of lifetimes through Vajrayana practice, or through Mahamudra practice, or Dzogchen practice. And uh, if that's the case, then we have to go through those stages, sort of, because it's about the mind getting purer and purer. It's about what defiles our mind getting less and less. That has to happen. And as the clouds in the mind disperse, the light of the mind shines more. So in Mahamudra accomplishment, everything we can do before there is stable Buddha mind is the stage of one point. Once through our Guru's kindness and our own compassion and so on, devotion, Buddha mind is awakened and is accessible and is more and more present, then we're in this uncomplicated phase. As we cultivate that, making the moments of Buddha mind presence longer and longer, more and more frequent in our day, then um, we go through the bodhisattva level experiences. We're in the stage of one taste. At the end, when we're Buddha, we don't have any more work to do. Everything is spontaneous. And that's what today's verses are really about. So let's leave that chart now. As I say, there were five Saturday sessions on this, if you want to get a better um, understanding. So let me get myself back on screen. So, yeah, let's leave that there. I do hope you think about this, about being on a path and the need at the very beginning to make your loving heart, your bodhisattva motivation for everybody, the foundation as much as you can of everything you do, whether it's on your cushion, whether it's in life, then the bodhisattva mind, bodhisattva teachings are our guidebook. So now today we come to verse 22. The nature of all beings 
is at all times Buddha. But since they do not understand this, they wander in endless samsara. May irrepressible compassion be born in me. Now, I've changed that last line from the version that you've got. Uh, it's, the Tibetan looks like unbearable compassion, but I want today to mm, share with you our present Taisitupa's explanation, which makes it clearer. So that's the verse. Let me give you the Tibetan transmission. Rowi Rangshin Tatu Sonji John Mato Wangi Tame Korwara John Dukmal Muta Me Pesimchenla Zome Ninje Jutla Jewarisho. So first let's uh, look at it simply the bottom line the basic thing who we are really all the time is buddha i'm buddha you're buddha buddha in me and buddha in you same buddha um, there isn't a chem buddha or you buddha that's our real, nat real nature. Problem is, we don't recognize it. We don't have realization. Now we've done the verse on realization, then you know what realization means. It is uh, or vipassana, or insight in this system. Mahamudra only means one thing. Buddha mind is present. So if that's not there, then we don't recognize it, then we are caught up in our stream of consciousness. And there is this constant feeling of I, me, experiencing experiences, even very sacred experiences, very vast ones very blessed ones. There is a core feeling of me experiencing it. And we might feel tiny, tiny, tiny humble, even like the tiniest speck in the vast array of all the Buddha's blessings and magnificence. But there's still somebody experiencing it. So that's the problem. Because of that, because of feeling the self, then we get involved with the self. In the verses we just finished, we saw how even when there's sacred experience of bliss, clarity, no thought, we can bring self to it, and then it gets sticky. So those things need to happen first, bliss, clarity, non-thought, before we can actually work with them to disentangle ego involvement. Because of this magnetic attraction to an interpretation that involves a me story, we are stuck in samsara. It says, they wander. We're so lucky. We've got a path. It's amazing. We know where we're going. It might take a thousand lifetimes. Might be nice. Take it easy, very safely, very gently. But each life a little bit better, a little bit better. However long it takes, we know we are going back home. Like the people who've been exiled on Mars with Elon Musk and his descendants, his children and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren who've ruled the Mars universe. And now 
we found the keys to the escape space rocket. <laughs> we can get out and go back home. Earth is ready. We can go swim in the rivers and pluck the pears and breathe the natural oxygen. We know where we're going. Nothing but goodness, kindness, peace, clarity of mind. None of the confusion, none of the fear. Fear goes at first bodhisattva level. It goes when ego's power goes. No ego, no fear. Until then we fear. We fear suffering, we fear death, we fear many things. So we're lucky we have a path. But most sentient beings don't. They are living in the present and not in the Buddhist way of living in the present, but in the worldly way of living in the present. So uh, it's only tomorrow that counts or even later today, immediate well-being. And as we know it so well from the Buddha's teachings, in order to get a bit of happiness in our current reality, sometimes we create a lot of havoc and a lot of suffering for ourselves and for others. So it says they wander. It's really de determined by what comes up next, what comes up next. You go here, you go there. It's so different from having a path. Because of the karma that is made through not recognizing our true nature, who we really are, then we will be caused to re be reborn again and again and again. And so it says in endless Samsara. Samsara is funny from a technical point of view. We say uh, beginningless, sometimes endless, sometimes it has an end. Whatever happens, it was always beginningless. No one can find a beginning. Uh, there wasn't a linear time when it all started doesn't make any sense, never happened. It's another story. For an individual story, like you, like me, it will end. But samsara itself, because we are not the only person in this universe, is endless. So we can stay in that endless samsaric interaction, getting into situations with him, her, these, business, war, love, all the, all those things that could be endless if we don't recognize the way our mind gets involved. Twelve links of interdependence, involvement in various stages, and then we make karma, and it goes on. So it could be endless, but we're on a path, and so we're going to put an end to it. Individually, there's an end, but as far as the rest, endless. And so these are some of the things our present Daisetupa explains in a simple explanation of this verse. Because they do not understand, they wander in endless samsara. So if we want to not wander, but get out of endless samsara, what do we need to do primarily? Understand. How do we understand? We've seen in previous verses by stilling the mind, going deep into the mind, where knowing one thing, the truth of our own mind, reveals everything and how it works and how it is. So it says, because of this, 
Because once you start doing it, it's so blooming obvious how people make their own suffering short term, medium term, long term. The way out is so obvious. Then there is, it says may, and in Tibetan it says, zerme is the adjective that describes compassion. Zerme, zer, usually means uh, forbearance, unbearable compassion, it looks like. But then what Taisitaba says, and very, very true, of course, is he says, when you read it, and then some lamas say uh, overwhelming, or if their English isn't too good, overwhelming. Some of them say, which is quite funny, overwhelming compassion. Um, gosh, the mind boggles. But anyway, uh, it kind of, okay, Vaisutupa says, it's not as though, oh, we see the suffering and we just can't bear it. We crack up, we're in tears, we're ripping our hair out. What can we do? That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Unbearable. Like you can't even turn your mind to it because it would wreck you. It's unbearable. It doesn't mean that. The z, which means what you can bear to do or what you can't bear to do, is that because of the compassion, you cannot bear not to do anything about it. Question, do I have this? Do you have this yet? This is why we need uh, to go through those first few, first two stages of the path where we develop absolutely as our core nature, the bodhisattva heart of compassion. So um, that's why I've changed the translation to irrepressible. You care so much. So that's the simple explanation. Now, in the eighth Taisitupa's commentary, we get um, that unpacked a little bit more. And it says there are three levels of compassion. And we study these in Bodhisattva teachings, of course. There are three levels of suffering corresponding. There are three levels of compassion. But the first level of compassion has sentient beings as its focus. So when sentient beings hurt, we feel for them and we want to help. That's worldly compassion because in worldly circumstances, it doesn't last. It's triggered by circumstances. We witness, we feel, we respond. We witness, at least we feel, sometimes we respond. But then when the trigger's gone, the compassion's gone. What we learn in the very beginning stages of our bodhisattva journey, stage of accumulation, stage of integration, is how to make our compassionate mind more and more present because we help ourselves to be aware of the suffering that's there all the time. Not just when it's triggered by what we see on TV, what we see in the street, what we see with our own close ones. We are helping ourselves wake up because we're asleep. Wake up to the huge, profound, deeply ingrained sufferings which are everywhere. So bodhisattva compassion and also an understanding of what can be done to help is very different from worldly, temporarily triggered mm, compassion. That's the first type of compassion, sentient beings and their pains, their woes or its focus. The second type of compassion, as because of our journey and acquiring Buddhist knowledge, is called compassion with dharma as its focus. 
Now here, dharma means the way things are, and in particular, cause and effect, the way karma is created. Uh, this morning, I went out to get my first morning uh, breath of air uh, after breakfast, and I could hear from the nearby hills, bang, 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 bang. So the wild boar uh, being uh, killed for Christmas. It's very sad, but I know my greengrocer is one of the people who's up in the hills going pop, pop with a gun and enjoying it. It's his favorite time of the week. He gets such pleasure out of the whole process, not just the actual killing and, uh, you know, and all the thing of taking home the meat to cook and making a sivet de sanglier for Christmas and so on. To get pleasure, we create pain often for others, but also through the power of karma, which always comes back for ourselves. So seeing this in ourselves, the way we repeat harmful patterns of thought, of speech, of physical activity, seeing the very nature of how it works. It's like a, an x-ray of how samsara works with dharma as a focus. Then we have compassion, not just for those who are hurting now, but for those who are getting their fun now, but creating future suffering for themselves. The masters of war who are making billions of dollars. The nationalists, the racists, all these people enjoying what they're accomplishing, but through the power of karma making trouble for themselves. So that's the second type of compassion. We particularly cultivate that on the first two stages of the path and current Taisitupa points to that as being a very necessary basis for what this verse talks about, which is the third type of compassion, which is called compassion with no focus. Why no focus? Because we are not trying to kindle it, trigger it by focusing on sentient beings, by focusing on the nature of karma, cause and effect. We don't need to do anything. This third type of compassion only comes when we reach Buddha mind, when we awaken to the true nature of our mind. It's we're awakened to it with our Guru's kindness and help, and then it becomes our default nature. So traditionally from the first Bodhisattva level onwards, or in the stage of non-complication in Mahamudra, then and only then, Buddha mind is naturally compassionate. You don't need to think something, you don't need to wind up, stir up, evoke compassion. It is 100% totally there. Buddha is compassion. So the eighth Taisitupa's commentary says this verse is about the third type of compassion, the natural compassion of the awakened mind. And it talks about in the commentary uh, a very famous phrase in Tibetan, it is Tong Ni Ninje Ningpo Chen Tong Ni Ninje Ningpo Chen Shunyata, voidness, which has compassion as its very heart. This is Buddha's voidness. It has compassion as its very heart. Compassion is not a side dish. 
in our Kaju view and in the Nimapa view, then compassion is not a secondary consequence of an enlightenment which is basically peace and shunyata, emptiness, voidness. So that when there are circumstances, compassion is triggered as a secondary, as a spin-off. Our view, the reality experienced by Tilopa, Naropa, Mapa, Milarepa, Gampopa, all the Kamapas, our view is that the truth of everything, the true nature of our mind, is compassion. And compassion and voidness are inseparable. They're one and the same. Voidness has to be compassionate. The compassion is there because of the void nature, the interdependent nature of everything. This is a very, very deep topic, topic of much debate. So, in the commentary, then we come to key points, and let me read you some some comment, some some of the commentary. So, in discussing this voidness with compassion at its very heart. Then there's a quote from a sutra, a sutra requested by a king, a Naga king, who was called uh, Ocean, Jatsu, Jamsu. And it says, um, Maras, Maras, demons, have two activities. Skillful means without wisdom. So for skillful means here, we can read compassion. Skillful means compassion, it's the same thing. So compassion without wisdom and wisdom without compassion. Know these to be Mara's work, abandon them. In Atisha's key text, Lamp for the Path, since it says that wisdom without compassion and compassion without wisdom are bondage, then abandon neither of these. So what we see that we are cultivating on our Dharma path, and we have to cultivate them a bit separately because that's the way we are, that's the way it is. Our wisdom, much of which we do on our cushion as we examine mind, as we examine things through mindfulness and discover voidness, shunyata. And then compassion, which on our path, we mainly cultivate when we're living interacting with people, with life and its circumstances. Bit by bit, what happens on the cushion, meditation and off it, post-meditation, start influence each other more and more, cross over, overlap more and more. And so by the time we've gone through the stage of accumulation and the stage of integration, then uh, those two things, compassion, voidness, wisdom, are very, very nicely interwoven, almost inseparable. If you're experience of voidness or your understanding of voidness lacks compassion then it's not best voidness let's say 
it is an intellectually fabricated voidness. And this is so tricky and it is so subtle because once we're good meditators, we can sit and our mind is so subtly, so efficiently constructing voidness, telling us how it's void, how it's empty, how it's damadatu, how it's shunyata. So softly you can't even hear the words. Of course, at loud, it's the beginning, it's loud. All those Buddhist quotations of its, you know, wherever they're from, from philosophy, from wonderful dohas, about how things are. That's become our Buddhist world. We're full of these things. And yeah, all void, man. Sometimes those words, we can say them a lot, or they're going through our head a lot as we witness life moment after moment. It quietens down, it quietens down the depth of meditation, the brilliance of our experience. And before this, we did the verses on experience and realization. Meditation experiences can be amazing. And there are so many of them. And they can feel so deep and so blessed and so expansive. But what we are looking at here is the best compassion, which happens only in best voidness, where we experience authentic Buddha mind. There's no question of it. There's no question of it. There's no question of the wisdom. Of course, everything's devoid. Of course, everything's empty interdependent. It's so much in your face, how could it be any other way? And spontaneously, there is compassion. So we are praying here, it's in the form of a prayer, may this irrepressible compassion, which means that you could not not do something about suffering because you're coming from a place of Buddha. Buddha doesn't pick and choose. You know, I help these, I help those. Whenever there's a call on compassion, then there will be a compassionate you know, response. I think so much of my own teacher, Akon Rinpoche, sometimes when, especially once he started traveling more, a number of people wanting to see him. And he'd be knackered, he'd be so tired. He'd need matchsticks to keep his eyes open. You saw him. But he would see people into late at night, first thing early in the morning. He would, he would never refuse. And though he had so much to do in Samueling, people would learn the art of buttonholing, finding out when he would be coming out to look at the building works or something, laying in wait so that you could suddenly appear and say, oh, Rinpoche, do you mind, could I just ask you something like that, something like this? Or when he was, anyway, let's not go there, but always there could only be a compassionate, spontaneous is the word, natural is another word, response, no artificial compassion. This is what we are praying for here. Now, in the next verse, which we have to well, let me just read a quotation from our present Taisitupa. He says, on top of that, even though one might pretend to be working towards the welfare of others, using just compassion, that doesn't realize empty, emptiness, voidness, what one ostensibly does for others, instead of accomplishing their welfare, at times actually creates obstacles for them. Since one's own virtuous endeavor is risky and contaminated. On the other hand, by only meditating on voidness, one's mentality strays into the paths 
of the Shravakas, of the Pracheka Buddhas. And that brings a long-term obstacle to our Bodhisattva journey. It means basically your meditation experience because we're in the voidness, the idea, the idea, the fabricated voidness, that everything is void. If you look closely, it's about my experience, my experience, me Buddha. It's not really about the welfare of others. The first feeling is me and where am I going and what's happening and so on and so on. And it's an involvement like we saw in last week's verse with the power of meditation, with the very nature of the experience of meditation. So in all those cases, we need help from our teachers to find the true Buddha mind, not our own projection or replica of it. Now the next verse carries on, carries on this idea, this reality. So that's verse 23. Let me give you the transmission. Zume ninje tsaliang mangapi tsedu mowo tongden jemparashar zunjuk gosa drawe namchokni jalme nyensen kundu komparashu towards beings in such boundless suffering, the energy of irrepressible compassion never ceases. Yet, while there is such love, the fact of its void essence appears nakedly. May I never be separate from this unerring, perfect path of simultaneity and put into practice day and night. Let me read you what Taisutaba, our current one, says about this. The first line says that the strength and the power of this compassion, which was earlier described as irrepressible, is always alive. Compassion never dies. It's always alive. And when this compassion manifests its loving kindness, the essence and the nature of what's happening is the naked, bare manifestation of shunyata. True compassion is not dualistic. It's not stubborn. It's not selfish. It is empty, open, all-pervading, beyond any kind of limitation to compassion. And when it's manifesting its kind activity, then its emptiness manifest as it is without any cover, without any kind of skin on it, shines bare. In the third sentence, he says, there is no way that the unity of compassion and emptiness can go wrong. Golsa in Tibetan, means there could be a way of going wrong. If you're traveling down a road and come to a junction that has three or four forks, you can make a mistake. But here, there will not be any way to make a mistake if compassion and shunyata are in unity. Then nothing can go wrong. So that's uh, from current Taisitupa. In the eighth Taisitupa's commentary, what he picks up is a point about activity. Now, you might have seen in the last couple of weeks that the eighth Taisitupa in his commentary, he is kind of batting off in like in a tennis match 
he hears what people in other traditions say as a criticism. And he kind of says, yeah, yeah some people might say this, but talk. And so one of the things we, we saw actually last week, when we looked into that a little bit, is um, people who practiced, what can we call it, obvious Vajrayana, deity practice, visualizations, mantras, inner energy work, chakra work, yogic exercises, and then so on and so on. That kind of Vajrayana path, like Mapa brought from India, uh, from Naropa, with so many teachings, uh, then in there, when you come to mastery of a practice, that means when you totally identified with, let's say, Chimrezik to make it easier. And so you are Chimrezik. When you sit and do your session, there's nothing but Chimrezik or Manipadma Hall and all the radiance and so on. And then there is what's called activity. And there are four activities in Vajrayana, pacifying, increasing, magnetizing, wrathful. So these are a big part important part of classical Vajrayana training. So some critics, obviously must have been, are saying, what about this magnificent Vajrayana way of helping other beings? Some need to be magnetized by um, the magnificence the charisma, the presence of teachers, they need to be drawn into this so that then through their connection, they'll listen. Some people receive a lot of teachings in a very funny way. The ears are half open, great teaching, great idea, but it kind of either goes in one ear and out the other, but it doesn't always go in the ears and trickle down to the heart. Sometimes we read about very subtle energy channels from the eyes to the heart or from the ears to the heart. We might think, gosh, there's some kind of mm, psychic pathways. <laughs> I think a lot of the meaning is you hear such wonderful teachings. <laughs> How much do they penetrate your heart and change you? We witness so much with our eyes. but there are kind of dams somewhere between what the eyes see and what the heart feels. So developing, in that case, I was talking about magnetizing energy so that people are so enthralled by your aura but then there's a chance they might listen. If Ken Holmes says it, and Taisitupa says exactly the same thing, there'll be people who will have heard it from Ken Holmes, but it will only go from their ears to their heart if Taisitupa says it, or Kamapa says it, or something like that. It's just a strange thing. So. And then there are pacifying activities and there are increasing activities. Um, these are deep topics in their own right. So if on the path, this necessary path, one hasn't been paying a lot of attention to those things, it, the critique is, so there you are, you Mahamudra, Kaju people, you're sitting there, you're doing lots of shamatha, using it as laboratory for insight meditation. You're looking at the nature of your mind and so on. Uh, you know, compassion, activity to help others, world out there, all that suffering, samsara, what are you doing about it? So the point in the commentary to this verse, the implicit meaning of this verse, is that there is not a compassion or compassionate activity separate from this most wonderful thing, Chikshe Kundra, being that one thing accomplishes everything. 
So there is a very special type of activity which comes from resting, being the true nature of mind, being Buddha. It's simple, isn't it? Does Buddha help beings or not? Of course he does, or she does, or it does. <laughs> of course Buddha helps. Does Buddha help beings a little bit? No, oh, more than anybody else. If there was somebody else who helped beings more than Buddha, we go to that person because we're kind. We want to help everyone. So if your mind becomes Buddha on your cushion, there's no final way to help other beings. Our path is in the Mahamudra is how to become Buddha. So in the commentary, the question is asked, this is somebody else's question. If that's so, then has activity, meaning the four activities of Tantra, not been taught anywhere up to this point? The response from Eighth Taisitupa, just this teaching about Mahamudra meditation is plenty enough to teach activity very well. So it says, generally speaking, this is the commentary. Activity in Vajrayana, in Tantra, is of two types, elaborate and simple. The first, the elaborate, is called external activity, and the second, internal. Of those two, the internal, simple activity is the best. But you won't find it anywhere else than in this yoga of Mahamudra. Remember, so this is why we went back, Chikshe Kundral, here Mahamudra, Zogchen, Great Middle Way, where they end up in Buddha mind, is what he means. He doesn't mean it's only in Mahamudra, not in Dzogchen, not in Middle Way. It doesn't mean that. But this that you've now found, this Buddha mind that's been introduced to you by your Guru, is the best activity to benefit beings. And he says, it's referred to as Samantabhadra activity because remaining within that state will produce all that one requires. So what does this make Ken Holmes think of? Well, it makes me think of two things amongst many. One is Akon Rinpoche talking about teachings, talking to me about teachers, Dharma teachers, very early on in the 1970s. And he told me, he said, when he was here, Trumpa Rinpoche had four students, four disciples, who wanted to be Dharma teachers. And he told them, you wanting to teach others could sound compassionate, but in fact, it's an obstacle, it's your ego, it's an ancient karma, you shouldn't do it. So he left the UK, Trumper and Bajay, and these four people remained. And of course, what did they all do? They went on to become self-proclaimed in a way, but once they were self-proclaimed long enough, they went to see eminent Buddhist teachers who said, yes, you can teach. So anyway, they wangled it one way or another so that they could become Buddhist teachers. And I can't remember, I mean, he was not happy with this because they basically disobeyed their guru's command. They'd followed their ego drive and it wasn't doing them 
and through the power of Samaya, their disciples, any good. He said, when you're ready, people will come to you. And he said this to me, when you're ready, people will come to you. You don't need to go out and find them. And uh, that's the first thing it makes me remember. The second thing is the most amazing example of this. When Milarepa tells Gampopa, he tells him different caves he needs to go and meditate in. And one of them is, uh, is uh, Dr. Gampo. It's a remote, uninhabited mountain region. And then Milarepa says, and that's where you're activity, it's what we're talking about, activity, compassionate activity to help others, will be. So that sounded strange to Gampopa because he knew that place. And somebody's sending you to a remote cave and saying, that's where you help many sentient beings. Because before that, Gampopa had had a dream. But it was a dream in which, uh, I think I talked about it, in which he thought it was a terrible dream. He smothered, he suffocated thousands of beings. And when he told it, so embarrassed to Milarepa, Milarepa said, that's a wonderful dream. Because it means that you will help thousands of beings overcome their ego, overcome their samsaric life. So anyway, he knew he was going to have a big activity. And here's Milarepa sending him to a remote cave where there's nobody. And he stayed there and he practiced and then one person pitched up and another person pitched up. And by the end of his life, 52,000 people had come to him. When you are ready, they will come to you, including the first come upper, of course, and many, many great teachers. So, by staying in this state, there is no finer activity to benefit all sentient beings, but it needs to be the authentic state. Real Buddha mind, shunyata, which has compassion as its very heart. If there's any question about your voidness, does it have compassion or doesn't it? It's not it. Don't even look. Compassion's not natural. It's like the water from a huge spring. There's a place near here where water gushes out the mountain face, feeds whole river. You don't have to ask if it's wet. Of course it's wet. It's water. So the shunyata of the Buddha, the shunyata is the whole reason for the compassion. Beings are clinging to things as though they're real, as though they're solid, as though they exist in their own right, rather than through a whole play of interdependence in their consciousness. They don't get it. But they're spontaneously compassion. It's like if you saw somebody eating poison berries and saying, well, these are delicious. Anyway, so um, there's a quote from the Guya Samaj, which is one of the main tantras, one of the ones that Mapa brought back from India. And I got time. Yeah, I wanted to mention that actually earlier on, I forgot. Uh, when Mapa went to India to get the various tantric teachings for Tibet, uh, one thing he discovered once he was there was the uh, Guya Samaj Tantra. And so he asked his guru, Naropa, about it. And Naropa sent him to a teacher called Kukuripa. Now, Kukuripa was weird uh, by worldly standards. He lived on an island in the midst of a poisonous swamp uh, with many serpents and dangers. Nobody went there. He himself looked absolutely repulsive and was lived with a hot pack 
of wild dogs. So they were, you know, not very friendly dogs. But anyway, he was sent there. <laughs> and so he braved all of that and Kukuri accepted him, gave him the Kya Samaj. But that's the Mother Tantra and teachings. And uh, and he gave him he gave him the Mahamaya teachings. But anyway, once he'd mastered these, this is the point, he went back to Naropa. And what, what Kukuripa told me is, but anyway, uh, Naropa knows all of this. In fact, he knows more about it than I do. And then when he's finished giving the transmission, he goes back to Nor Naropa. And he said, he said, do you get it? Yeah, you managed to get there? Yeah. You saw him? <laughs> like that. You got the teachings? Yeah. And then Mapa says, but he said, you could have given me all of this. In fact, you know more about it. And the robber said, yeah, but he's been doing this all his life. He has a very special direct transmission. He's the real best holder of this lineage. I hold many lineages, but he's the one. I wanted you to get that sort of like that from him. And then he, Naropa gave him some, some more uh, instructions. Uh, on it. So I wanted to mention that earlier, in the Chikshe Kundral, you know one thing, then you know all of them. And in that verse where it says, Mahamudra, Sokchen, middle way, they're the same. Well, they're the same because they're paths leading to the same Buddha mind. But then in themselves, they're not the same because their methods vary and they have their own powerful transmissions and lineages. And that's how we need to respect the other traditions like Dzogchen tradition, uh, because it is the powerful holder of its own techniques. But at the same time, we need to know that their techniques lead to where we're going. And in this verse, then we need to know that although others are developing compassionate activity, as bodhisattvas, as tantrikas doing the four special pacifying, increasing, magnetizing, wrathful activities, that by Practicing Mahamudra, the simple way, the unelaborate way, as it says in the commentary, then we are heading towards the finest compassion and compassionate activity and in the best of ways. Our path involves sitting, shamatha, inside the Vipassana, mainly through devotion to our lineage and our gurus. Through those, devotion and practice, then the compassion will automatically, spontaneously be there. So in the Gya Samaj it says, this is the finest yoga of all. It's worthy of the Tathagata's veneration. Because of this are the countless practices of renunciation so very well known. Due to this do the countless samadhis of gods arise so perfectly. From that yoga, the utterly perfect mudra, the utterly perfect mandala, the utterly perfect mantras arise both pacification and increasing and magnetizing and wrathful activities. They will all happen spontaneously without needing to train in them. And these will arise in numbers like the sands, grains of sand in the river Ganges. All of the subtle cities that there are, all of the other mudra cities that are renowned on the bodhisattva levels, all arise from this very yoga. This is something you should know. 
the meditation of primordial wisdom in which compassion and wisdom are non-dual is, is in itself the compassionate enlightened activity of Vajrayana. So that's it for today's uh, talking talk and uh, hey we're going to finish next weekend so we had uh, just a final teaching verse a dedication and uh, so let's today dedicate uh, anything that was good and useful and meaningful to of course to the welfare of all sentient beings but now through what we've seen today a very special dedication that we can practice Mahamudra and go to the very best compassion, the very heart of compassion, as swiftly as possible. Sonam diye tamche zikpane topne nye pedranam pamche ne je ganna chipalap krukpaye sipe sole drowa drowa resho Janchub semcho rinpoche ma je panam je jochik je pan yam pame padam kong ne kong do per waran sho gewa di in yoduda cha ja chen po truk jone krowa chik jang malopa te yesala kam paran sho